Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Sharik, resident urology, uh, presenting uh, general club. The topic for today's general club is leukocytes and bacteria in the urine. So, what are the objectives? Uh, every resident should be known at the end of uh, this uh, discussion. You should be able to understand about the dipstick testings, understand about what is pyuria and bacteria, exact definitions of these two terms, and uh, should be able to appreciate uh, bacteria and leukocytes under microscopy, how they look like, and, and understand the pathogenesis of the UTI and uh, the management plan for pyuria and bacteria. So before uh, going into details, as this topic relates to uh, urine sampling, uh, we see the bacteria and pyuria in the urine samples. One should know about how to collect the urine specimen, as this is the first step in the uh, analysis of urine DR. So, uh, when we prescribe uh, urine DR to any patient, please uh, give one or two minute to at least patient to at least counsel him how to collect properly the urine sample as uh, it may lead to false positive and false negative results. So uh, please give time to the patient and uh, let him understand. So in the male patients, if the patient is uh, circumcised, a clean catch intermittent midstream urine sample is enough. But if he is uncircumcised, then he should uh, retract the foreskin clean it with some antiseptic solution and uh, should uh, retract the foreskin during the widening phase and, uh, and then obtain a midstream urine sample. So this is for the uncircumcised males. In females, uh, the chances of contamination are more. Uh, so uh, proper cleaning of the vulva and the uh, separation of the labia followed by a collection of a midstream urine. Uh, after all this uh, preventive measures, uh, instead of all these pre uh, preventive measures, there is a chance of contamination in females uh, because uh, short of short urethra and the surrounding perineum is uh, very close to the urethra. So in a female, ideally a catheterized sample uh, should be done, but uh, if it's not possible, then do proper. Uh, do follow proper antiseptic measures and proper way to collect the specimen. While in children, uh, usually a catheterized sample is uh, recommended or a suprapubic uh, aspirate is recommended. So after uh, the patient uh, collected his urine or his, her urine, then uh, it should be examined within an hour. So usually the catheter uh, urine is directly coming from the uh, bladder. So uh, we just uh, clean the catheter uh, uh, tip and then collect it. No, no, I will not take the sample from bag. I will just uh, disconnect the bag and uh, collect it from the uh, port side. So after uh, the sample is collected, it should be examined within one hour. Otherwise, uh, uh, it may uh, uh, provide time for bacterial overgrowth or may change the pH and certain uh, uh, disintegration of the red and white cells. So it should be examined within one hour. And if not possible, then refrigerate the sample at five degrees centigrade. So after collection, now what to see in a urine DR? There are certain uh, properties which you have to examine in the urine DR sample. For example, you have to examine the physical properties, its chemical properties, do a microscopy and cytology if needed. So what to be seen in physical examination? Usually the color of the urine, uh, usually pale yellow. Usually fresh urine has no turbidity, it's clear. And specific gravity ranges between 1.01 to 1.035 and the pH average is between 5.5 and 6.5. Chemical examination of the urine usually done by a dipstick test. So what are the dipstick? 
everybody should know about what are these these are a strong uh, short plastic strips with some impregnated chemicals on it uh, which react with the certain chemicals in the urine to produce some color changes in it so what are these chemicals uh, so this is a, a lipstick uh, uh, picture showing a uh, different uh, chemicals on it and this is uh, the way uh, you do a dipstick test you dip you dip the stick in the urine and then uh, uh, twist uh, turn it to one side so that uh, excess urine will trickle off and make sure that uh, the urine doesn't uh, mix in between the chemicals so it may produce some false results so these are the substances to be detected by dipstick these are usually not present in the uh, normal urine so these are in uh, abnormal conditions you see these things like blood protein glucose ketones uroblenogen and white blood cells so as our topic is related to leukocytes and bacteria we will discuss uh, how to interpret and see these things in the urine so leukocytes in the urine so you can detect uh, leukocytes via two methods in a urine sample either via dipstick that is an indirect way and via microscopy so in the dip stick basically uh, the leukocyte esterase enzyme in the leukocytes uh, produce a color change uh, by uh, catalyzing the hydrolysis of endoxyl carbonic acid to an endoxyl group which then reacts uh, oxidize a diazonium salt present on the dip stick to produce a color change so this is how you uh, detect leukocyte presence in the DR there but there are certainties that you get a false negative and false positive false positive more most commonly seen uh, in the contaminated uh, sample or in the presence of formalin while false negative results are seen in um, increased urine specific gravity in glycosuria presence of uroblinogen and ingestion of large amount of ascorbic acid now come to nitrite testing it relates to the bacteria basically nitrates are uh, n normally uh, nitrites are normally not found in the urine but nitrates do so what does uh, some gram negative bacteria does that they convert the nitrates in the urine to nitrites so this can give you a clue that uh, this sample has bac uh, bacteria in the urine but again false positive results are very common especially in the contaminated uh, urine sample so how to confirm it uh, the dipstick findings so you go for microscopy of the sample so uh, in microscopy you have got two magnifications like low power magnification and high power magnification what do you see on low power uh, you can see erythrocytes leukocytes casts crystals or um, you can see parasites as well on high power micro uh, magnification you can uh, see dysmorphic erythrocytes so this is important in cases of glomerulonephritis where there are dysmorphic uh, erythrocytes so uh, leukocytes usually uh, normal uh, is one to two leukocytes per high power field in man considered uh, normal and up to five in female in which uh, home uh, the sample is not uh, contaminated then you have to distinguish between old and fresh leukocytes on microscopy usually uh, the old leukocytes are from contamination usually from the vaginal leukocytes they are old leukocytes these are small wrinkled leukocytes while the fresh leukocytes suggestive of active infection they are usually glitter cells in the urine they have uh, some granules in the uh, cytoplasm which are keep moving uh, giving the resemblance of a glitter cell on microscopy so uh, these are the two pictures uh, you see in on microscopy one is a fresh leukocyte and uh, the other one is of old leukocytes see the crumpled uh, leukocytes are old and the fresh one have some glitter cells this now come to the bacteria usually uh, it is uh, suggested that uh, five bacteria per high power field reflects a colony count of around 10 is to 5 
that is the standard concentration used to establish the diagnosis of UTI after a clean catch specimen. But uh, this label uh, should apply in women only after a clean catch con uh, uh, urine sample. So these are some uh, gram negative bacteria, how they look like on the microscopy. Uh, this is an example of a staph aureus seen in the clumps. And these are some streptococcal UTI, uh, streptococci arranged in the chains. So uh, should uh, everybody should know how they look like on microscopy and should know how to interpret the leukocytes and bacteria on microscopy. Like the other thing is that cast. One should know uh, what is the cast and uh, WBC cast uh, especially as related to our topic. So a cast is a protein coagulum that is formed in the renal tubule and traps any tubular luminal content within the matrix. In our uh, current uh, presentation, WBC cast is important and as it is observed in acute glomerulonephritis, acute pyelonephritis and acute tubular interstitial nephritis. So this is how they look on microscopy. So, uh, so now, uh, what is this uh, protein coagulum? Uh, basically, a TAM horsefall protein is usually most commonly uh, the matrix protein. And so now, uh, come to the proper definitions uh, and pyuria or and bacteria. So, what is bacteria? It is the presence uh, of bacteria in the urine, and it may be asymptomatic or symptomatic. If uh, and bacteriuria without pyuria indicates the presence of bacterial colonization rather than the presence of active infection. So, if you find bacteriuria alone without uh, leukocytes, consider two things: whether it is uh, contamination or uh, uh, whether uh, it is asymptomatic bacteriuria due to colonization. So, these two uh, groups are very important. Now comes to pyuria. Pyuria is the presence of WBCs in the urine. And uh, again, uh, when you see leukocytes in the urine, consider two things, whether it is due to infection or due to some inflammation. Or there is another entity that is a sterile pyuria. So interpreting pyuria, consider these, these things in your differentials. So a sterile pyuria, there is only leukocytes in the urine without any organisms. So when you see this uh, clinical scenario, consider things like carcinoma in C2, TB, stones, and um, interstitial cystitis, glomerulonephritis. So just don't uh, let the patient go home if he has leukocytes only and culture negative. Think about these causes as well. Why is having leukocytes in the urine? So uh, a brief slide about epidemiology. Uh, just uh, remember that uh, in the early adult age, it is more common in the female groups. But uh, as a patient uh, grows in 60s, the male and female uh, population usually gets the same UTI uh, incidence and prevalence because in males then you get prostate and obstructive uropathies as well. So that increases the chances of uh, UTI in old age. So in young patients, females are more prone and uh, while in at old age, both groups are at the same risk. So uh, a brief account on the how the UTI uh, gets uh, developed in the uh, humans. So there are certain routes of uh, developing an infection. So ascending root is the most commonly seen in humans because the ascending bacteria from the colon, vagina, perineum gets inserted into the urethra and then uh, ascends up to the bladder and upper tract and cause uh, UTI symptoms. Then hematogenous root is rarely seen but uh, can be seen with staph, uh, septicemia, fungemia and mycobacterium TB. And why uh, lymphatics is again uh, rare, but seen in inflammatory bowel disease and from retroperitoneal abscess as well. So, what is the pathogenesis? So, uh, consider that uh, any infection can happen in the body 
if the disbalance occurs between host defense or there is increased virulence of the bacteria. So either the bacteria gets high virulence or the host gets its immunity less. So chances of uh, any infection is greater. So is with the uh, UTI. So what are these factors that bacteria uh, develop to evade the immune system of the humans? So these are some adhesions mechanisms, avoidance of host defense mechanisms, and antimicrobial resistance. Why three these mechanisms bacteria can invade the human body and uh, bypass the uh, immune mechanism of uh, humans. So in adhesion mechanisms, bacteria usually gram-negative have some uh, pili or fimbriae on their surface, uh, which uh, helps them to attach to the mucosal layer of the human body. Like suppose in the bladder, they get uh, attached themselves by these uh, pili. So there are uh, classification of the pili and type one pili are usually menosensitive. These are basically done on the basis of uh, hemagglutination these uh, pili uh, for occur in in vitro testing. So type 1 pili uh, are usually present in E. coli that are associated with cystitis, while the P. pili are associated with the pyelonephritis most of the time, and S. pili associated uh, infections are usually in the both the bladder and the kidneys. And how do they avoid host defense mechanism? Uh, usually by uh, uh, extracellular capsule, they reduce the immunogenicity and resist phagocytosis by the human uh, uh, cell lines. And uh, what toxins, they produce certain toxins, like for instance, hemolysin in the E. coli causes direct pathogenic effects on host erythrocytes. And by production of enzymes, Certain bacteria produce uh, certain enzymes, for instance, protease produce uh, urease that converts the urea into ammonia and then contributes to a disease process, for instance, stone formation in humans. Now, this is an emerging uh, uh, issue in modern era that uh, more and more use of antibiotics causes resistance in the bacteria, and uh, this can occur by enzyme inactivations. Many bacteria you have seen that causes have a beta lactamase that inhibit the beta lactam ring of uh, certain antibiotics and uh, then you have uh, they have altered permeability to the uh, transport mechanism to certain antibiotics as well and then the binding site variation for antibiotics also leads to drug resistance. Now, what are the host defenses? Uh, usually uh, divided into general and specific uh, organ related as well. So these are the general host defenses that protect against uh, any infection. There just is just a word about pili uh, in, in the previous slide, or the, the one back. Uh, pili are very important because uh, <coughs> it gets um, into the process uh, when a bacteria is, has got an affinity for a particular mucosal surface. Yes. For instance, there are certain bacteria which have got a liking for a urinary tract. There are certain bacteria which have got a liking for the gastrointestinal tract. And it is actually because of these specific pili that they get attached to or they, they like certain surfaces. Uh, th this is a, uh, a growing field of interest to manipulate and do something to attack this kind of uh, attachment site. So uh, uh, these are very important structures. Yes. And part of the resistance of uh, the drugs is also because of the reason that there is some phenotypically different pili produced as a result of a drug which is for which is used for a bacteria in order to kill that bacteria. So if you overexpose a bacteria, then bacteria are also intelligent beings. They mm -hmm. can make their own changes. They can mutate, for instance, and uh, uh, their virulence will be different. So that is the reason why for the past 100 years or so, uh, we have seen resistance of uh, bacteria for a particular group of antibiotics. And then we have to change the antibiotics because they are also changing. They're also making their own defense mechanisms 
uh, not only varied but also stronger enough to withstand any new antibiotic. Exactly. So, uh, regarding host defenses, uh, usually the commensal flora that uh, compete with the, uh, the invading organism for nutrients and uh, stimulate the immune system and alters the pH, so preventing the UTI. Then mechanical integrity of the mucous membrane is very important and certain mucosal secretions like lysozymes and then uh, some other uh, enzymes that interrupt the bacteria to invade the human bodies and urinary immunoglobulins A usually inhibit bacterial adherence. Then again, uh, adherence is the initial step in any UTI and again the pili are important in, in this thing. Specific mechanisms or mechanical flushing of the urine through the urine tract is important mechanism. So, as we have seen that in the obstructed kidneys, uh, the chances of UTI or recurrent UTI are more due to stasis of the urine. And uh, mucosaccharide coating of the bladder help prevent bacterial attachment. And certain glycosaminoglycans on the bladder mucosa prevent adhere bacterial attachment. And then urine pH and osmolarity inhibits the growth. And uh, in females, lactobacillus has a role that uh, it converts glycogen into lactic acid, causing a decrease in pH, and then uh, inactivate the bacteria. So, uh, so after collecting a proper urine sample and uh, examining it, one finds that it has a leukocyte positive urine or pyuria. So now, what to do? if uh, you get such a scenario. So, if you get a positive urine, but a patient is symptomatic or suppose uh, have a nitrite positive, then this is a kind of a bit straightforward thing. If he's symptomatic and have a leukocytes and bacteria and the urine is suspecting UTI, then treat him. If you need imaging studies, if you're suspecting uh, obstruction, then treat accordingly. But what if uh, only leukocytes are positive without any symptoms and nitrite positivity? Think about, uh, see also, you see microscopic hematuria as it is also an inflammatory marker. So uh, do look for microscopic hematuria as well. What if you don't find any microscopic hematuria? Now just think about any sexual infection because usually in the sexual infections you see only leukocytes without any uh, organism in a normal stain or there are certain intracellular leukocytes suppose in gonococcal infection. So uh, do not think, think beyond the boundary uh, that it could happen. Take a proper sexual history and if needed then do some tests for STDs as well, nucleic acid amplification tests for gonorrhea as well. All right, then uh, think about uh, this thing if you got only leukocyte positive urine. Ask about recently treated UTI. Sometimes a uh, patient get inappropriate antimicrobial treatment. So in this case, if only leukocytes are present in the urine and the patient is asymptomatic, then uh, you, you repeat the analysis after one week and uh, retreat if it persists. Then there is, comes the thing of persistent UTI. That is a type of uh, recurrent UTI in which uh, you get the same organism and which hides in some needles in the urinary tract. Okay, so when to do amazing studies in uh, in this scenario? So usually they are not uh, recommended unless uh, you think about some anomaly in the anatomy or the functional status of the genitourinary tract, right? To do amazing in in those patients, for instance, uh, if a patient with a stone, like uh, said previously, uh, stones cause uh, pyuria as well. So you, this can give you a clue that a patient with only pyuria without bacteria in the urine, you can think about stones and other causes of only pyuria. Similarly, you can uh, think about any foreign body in the body. May have, it may, patient may have a digestant, suppose, which you don't know, which you forget about. So you think about these things. And TB, TB infection on the UTI, again presents with pyuria only, no organism in a normal stain. So think about tuberculosis infection as well. 
and history of uh, water bathing uh, uh, leads to or, uh, or travel to any endemic area um, it, patient may have schistosomiasis though rare but uh, it, it should be in the differentials so uh, if a leukocyte positive urine without pyuria and without any symptoms think about the other causes of uh, pyuria just don't let the patient go home okay, he has negative culture he doesn't uh, he is not unwell and uh, we just let them go home with uh, leukocyte urea or pyuria think about the other causes as well now you see this is very important uh, uh, not only um, whenever some somebody comes to you for instance with uh, a report uh, and uh, somebody else has done it um, ordering the report um, and in that case you have got um, maybe presence of uh, leukocytes in addition to presence of bacteria now in that case if you uh, take a history you, you you should have a lot of things at the back of your mind uh, as I understand the subject um, what are those things uh, if I classify them then there may be some anatomical abnormalities that I want to look for I want to ask for and also some abnormalities which are related to uh, functional problems for instance urodynamic um, uh, stability um, normality of urodynamics for instance if a person has got spina bifida or a, sp a person has got a history of a trauma to the spine or the person is not properly urinating because of any any problem then that report should be uh, judged and uh, uh, interpreted in the light of that kind of a history you see that there, there has to be something which leads to uti uh, uti doesn't happen um, in any any person without any cause mm. there has to be a cause and sometimes the cause is there uh, very evident sometimes it is not there so uh this pregnant uh, uh, female group is important as uh, asymptomatic bacteria uh, should be screened and uh, treated Do not, we cannot let them go with asymptomatic bacteria as there are high chances of pyelonephritis and preterm labor so screen these patients and in children uh, it is recommended not to do amazing uh, unless uh, a recurrent uti occurs or, or suspecting any anatomical or uh, um, functional anomaly of the system so uh, only do imaging if if you are suspecting these things and uh, modalities are ultrasound to see the upper track you can do a dmsa to see a scarring due to previous uh, any uti or an mcug to see any reflux uh, uropathy so uh, if the patient comes to you with a bacteria on the urine analysis then uh, see if he is or her symptomatic and uh, see whether febrile if uh, these are the findings then need uh, upper track imaging to see whether the system is obstructed or not and need decompression or IV antibiotics so uh, this is the one group of the patient now the other group is that patient has bacteria patient is uh, symptomatic but not that unwell so you can give him empirical antibiotics or treat acute cystitis or wait for a definite culture report and treat accordingly now if the patient has bacteria and is not symptomatic then consider that whether he has pyuria in his urine only bacteria doesn't in a asymptomatic does not need treatment most of the time it is due to a contaminated sample so recheck the sample and if there is again persistent finding and then label it as asymptomatic bacteria and then find out the cause of asymptomatic bacteria in this patient and uh, this can be done with a uh, imaging studies so if you find any anomaly on the imaging then treat that anomaly uh, accordingly because this can lead to uh, a, a symptomatic UTI later on if you don't find any anomaly and the patient has asymptomatic bacteria then these are the three groups that need a special consideration there is a pregnant and child 
and uh, those patients who are going some uh, urologic investigations. So these three groups need to be treated uh, in uh, lieu of uh, asymptomatic bacteria. Now, uh, what if the patient has uh, bacteria but uh, no pyuria and you have uh, ruled out contamination as well? So consider empiric anti antibiotics in the patient. If no response occur, then uh, you can go for imaging studies, see why the response has not occurred. Or is there any uh, persistent bacteria in the system? There should be a nidus of that bacteria that has to be ruled out by imaging and further testing. And if you find any anomaly on that uh, imaging studies, then treat them accordingly. And uh, if you don't find any anomaly, then label it as asymptomatic bacteria and treat only in these three groups, pregnant, child, and those undergoing urologic interventions. Now, sometimes what you, what you get is, uh, for instance, in um, um, six months of gestation, if uh, a woman comes to you with um, pyuria and uh, when you do some imaging, for instance, ultrasound, you get to know that both the kidneys are mild to moderate hydronephrotic. So um, one thing that comes to your mind is whether you should decompress the kidneys, whether you should prescribe uh, medicine, uh, how should you proceed? Uh, what, what is in your mind? Uh, basically, like uh, previously said, you have to think about the causes of uh, pyuria as well, without bacteria. In this scenario, as she has obstructed kidney, uh, present to you with pyuria only. Now, we'll see whether uh, uh, she is uh, symptomatic and uh, what is her renal functions uh, that need decompressions uh, as well. You see, when a woman is uh, pregnant and in maybe six months plus gestation, then the upper tract tend to dilate yes. without any obstruction. So how come you know that there is an obstruction which is causing um, dilatation of upper tract and you have to decompress it? This is a practical problem. Uh, ultrasound full bladder in order to rule out the distal ureteric stone number one if a stone is not seen then we can go for the ureteric jets and resistive index as well you see you, you have to do a little bit of exercise again um, you, you have to exhaust a little bit of um, imaging technique for instance just to know whether there is a cause of obstruction or not don't label the person as having obstructed kidneys just on the basis of finding hydronephrotic kidneys yes so that that is the point which uh, i am referring to whenever a person with this kind of history comes to you you always do a little bit of thinking uh, investigation sort of a police work finding the evidence first don't do decompression first that's my um, plea um, as dr rabia has said you have to find out whether there is an obstruction in the ureter in the form of a smaller stone which may be on unilateral or maybe bilateral uh, whether there is something which is obstructing the upper tract um, by means of a stone at puj is there anything which is extramural or is there anything which is intramural uh, you can do it by an ultrasound, but sometimes the ultrasound will not give you a picture. It will give you, for instance, a hydroureter, but not the presence of a stone. Then you have to rule out whether this is because of pre-existing uh, VUR. You can do it by decompressing the bladder, by putting a catheter inside and repeating your, your ultrasound. You can also do... Uh, at the very last instance, something called low dose CT scan, right? So there are ways and means of doing about the investigative work, but you have to do an investigative work because this patient has got normal renal function. This patient has got 
no previous history you don't have any history this patient has got uh, asymptomatic bacteriuria and she has got a history of six months plus gestation but if this is a renal failure patient having an obstructive nephropathy and the creatinine is high then you have to puncture it without doing anything else mm. so there has to be a philosophy how you have to manage your patient because this is your patient you can't just tell her to go away because once you do something like decompression and she has got like maybe 3 months ahead of her before delivery then she has to be with this kind of decompression for the less of 3 months so whatever you do as a clinician you must um, justify yourself that you you are doing it for the betterment of the patient and for what reason for instance if there is uh, obstructive nephropathy you want to create another scenario where with pcn you want to have or you want to see creatinine falling down to normal levels because that that is very important um, for normal delivery also or for the decision of maybe in the later period of doing cesarean section so all these things matter they matter and they fall in the domain of a urologist these decisions will not be taken by a gynecologist these decisions will be taken by a urologist particular so a urologist has to think a little bit more than what the gynecologist is thinking yes, right exactly all patients all patients with the obstruction does not need treatment because yes. the obstruction is not always pathological it can be a physiological particularly in a pregnant females when the gravity uterus compresses upon the ureter from outside and it uh, uh, it's physiological it does not Uh, need treatment or decompression or anything else until unless there is a renal failure or some some complicated things are there exactly so uh, what is the take home message that uh, everybody should uh, know the causes of sterile pyuria because straight forward pyuria uti is a straight forward thing but sterile pyuria everybody should know the causes so that will lead you to further management of uh, sterile pyuria and uh, should know when to treat uh, asymptomatic bacteria and like i said in pregnant in child and in those who are undergoing uh, endoscopic intervention so these are the two uh, groups which uh, need to be considered otherwise the documented infection with symptoms is a straightforward uh, management so these are the two things uh, which in the uh, in this topic need to be uh, considered in details in the treatment options of a patient thank you so much